I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast. Joining me is Coleman Hodges, Swim Swam Head of Production, and the man on the scene, on deck, to interview you. Joining us today is five-time Olympic gold medalist, perhaps the nicest guy in swimming. Certainly, he's a good dude. Nathan Adrian. <laughs> What's up, guys? doing you're doing a podcast with us thanks buddy yeah no thanks for having me i appreciate it uh, are you are, yeah life are is you good. Zoom, are, are you zoomed out are you a little bit zoomed out zoomed out yes. yeah you've been doing a lot of zooms <laughs> yes i was like i was like is this uh what are we talking about here are we talking about life or are we just talking about like actual zoom meetings uh you know honestly what happened i'd, I'd say was like at the beginning insane amounts of zoom as swim teams were all trying to figure out how to keep their swimmers engaged and i was happy to do it um and then as people started reopening the zoom request started slowing down a little bit um and then it, it weirdly happens in waves like it'll be like i'll go like a full week and nothing on the schedule and then i'll like talk to like my wife or talk to like my business partner will and be like dude i i can't do anything next week like i have like six or seven different meetings that gotta be on you're not only an olympic superstar but it should be said that okay we're gonna say it you're 31 years old you've been, <laughs> at, this a long, you've been at this a long time but you have the foresight to be building a business bridging into the future and uh not all olympic stars do that and uh that's right. You now own a swim school, and in the midst of owning a swim school, a pandemic hits. Uh, how you been holding up? Yeah, it's been crazy. Uh, so we acquired the swim school last year, and we had the original, uh, the, the woman that had been running it, uh, we had her help us transition. Um, and that was great. Very, very helpful because, you know, she needed to show us what the existing business was. And then this year we we're like, oh yeah, like we got all the employees info. We like we automated a bunch of stuff, threw it up online. This year's gonna be so much easier. <laughs> and then it was looking to be that much easier. We were like, oh yeah, we have like all of our best teachers. This is gonna be great. And then we started taking signups. Uh, I think on like I think we started taking signups on either a Saturday or a Sunday. And then Monday was when the Bay Area went into shelter in place. And we were like, oh, no, <laughs> like, how long is this going to last? And people are calling us asking, hey, when do you think you can open? And we're like, I have no idea. Like, I mean, I'm following, like, you know, the county commissioners. Like, actually, that's what zoomed me out. I, I remember one day I spent, like, four hours watching county commissioner meetings trying to figure out what the heck was going on and when we could open the pool and with what restrictions we could open the pool with. And – if you want to like punish your children, Mel, force them to watch <laughs> county commissioner meetings because it is not fun at all. And you're and you're and you're dealing with this while you're en route to an Olympic Games, which is not going to happen. Pushed off <laughs> for a year, trying to figure out how you're going to train. Uh, at 31, I'm I'm wondering, you know, you know, I I don't know if if you like, if you have like any some micro injuries or something that maybe you could heal from. We know that you've overcome cancer, but it's like I'm wondering like physically after all this sprinting and pounding and explosive power, I'm I'm wondering if this time might help our our big nitro blue ribbon event swimmers. Actually, yeah, that's what I've been been finding out a little bit. Um, interesting you say that. I, I certainly have changed uh, kind of my thoughts uh, and goals in the weight room and then even in the pool um, right now because I, I can't, I couldn't sustain the level of training we were doing um, when all this happened for another year. Uh, there's just, there's just no way I would, I would totally break down like physically and probably emotionally as well. Um, but to your point, um, I mean, every, every week, every couple weeks, I noticed that something has come back, uh, from surgery that I never really knew was gone in the first place, uh, which is awesome. Uh, I mean, that, that kind of comes with the territory. They cut through my, uh, you know, abdominal cavity or abdominal wall five different times. So I, I just lost a lot of coordination there. I, I have a lot of, um, you know, misfiring when it comes to muscles and, and every, every couple weeks, every week, I'm just like, oh, wow, like my shoulder, I can get a little bit more out of it now. Like, 
Um, or, hey, I, like my left leg, it's, it's feeling good. Like I feel a little bit more balanced, a little bit more like explosive power out of that leg uh, than I did a little bit ago. So there is, there is a little bit of that going on. And then um, to, to your point, I mean, it was, it was awesome being able to take this time and, and not work on being as powerful and as explosive as I possibly can be in my little like home weight room, my little, like, little training area. And working a little bit more on like flexibility and range of motion and being able to control that range of motion. Cause I think that's like, that's one of the biggest disconnects I think in swimming. Uh, like a lot of us are crazy flexible, right? Just like look at any, anyone warming up on the pool deck, they're doing stuff with their shoulders that most physical therapists would like, you know, shout, stop, 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 don't do that. Uh, but you know, if you can control that range of motion, it's a whole different story. Uh, and, and I think you see that underwater when you're seeing the guys or girls, um, you know, with this, that early vertical forearm, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, and they're actually controlling that, actually generating power versus just going to those end ranges of motion and just kind of lying on their tendons and ligaments and their stretch reflex to, to make sure they're going to stay in their, in their shoulder joint. Are you a yogi? Uh, not so much. I actually used to do... I used to do yoga, uh, but I actually appreciate um, a little bit more of the like meditation from it as recovery um, and as like sort of a transition from like uh, sympathetic to parasympathetic um, after a tough practice. I think that's that's what I use it for, and that's what I feel like it's most valuable for me. I asked you about this before, and you're like, it's too hard. I want to recover from practice. That was your answer. I, and you know it's true. Like I look at we're we're talking. I was I was showing up to the weight room. How would this work? I don't remember what the exact. It's like it's been so long since I've been on a normal schedule. But I would go to the weight room and be lifting weights for a little over an hour. I would come in and then I would do a tough set. Um, you know maybe like on Tuesdays it would be like a lactate set. And then we would go into yoga and for an hour. And she was wonderful, a great yoga teacher. But like. I'm looking to try to zone out. I want to focus on my breath for 45 minutes. I don't want to do a tree pose. I don't want to do a downward dog into this, into that. Like, I mean, we were all just sweating bullets. I, I was hungry. Uh, it, it just wasn't the right timing for that for me. Um, I, I just needed to med go home, eat some food, recover, meditate, and then try to sleep. I got it. What if it's, but you did talk about range of motion while we're in the shutdown. What have you been doing to increase your range of motion? Um, I actually don't need to do a ton to increase my range of motion. I, I am pretty hypermobile as it stands. Like my, my family, is, like my sister had to get her shoulders tightened up after she stopped swimming. Um, so it's more or less controlling that range of motion for me. And it's like doing like little body blade exercises or like, you know, trying to trying to reel in my, my ego here and, and throw it like I don't I don't even have like a one pound uh, like barbell, but like a water bottle for instance, just holding it at a, like over my head on a, in a prone position, um, trying to make sure that the right muscles are engaged and I'm not just hanging out on like you know overworking one rotator cuff or, or the other. Making that sound like some high level stuff. Coleman said that I BS too much in podcasts and I need to get into good questions. So Coleman, you, you take it over, buddy. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> that's the, the exercises you're talking about doing are really interesting. I also think it's interesting. You know, you talked about yoga as a form of meditation. Have, have you, you know, outside of, of uh, strength training, mobility training, have, have you done any sort of breath work, meditation, mental training during this quarantine period that you wouldn't have normally gotten into? You know, honestly, I was so busy with the swim school uh, that <laughs> I probably didn't do as much to take advantage of this time off um, as I could have or should have. Um, I don't really regret it because I, I think it was a wonderful learning experience. Um, but during this time, no. But I, I certainly have tried the Wim Hof thing. Um, I, I, I haven't had as much success as, as some other people, uh, but it was, it was awesome. Uh, again, just a great, I think it's, it's really interesting just getting to do that stuff to learn about yourself, learn about your body. Um, just another, another example, like why spending eight, nine hours at the office in the swim school? Why is it so tiring? And I'm like, Oh, I get it because like I'm saying hi to all the customers and 
I, uh, you know, I was, I was coaching an hour a day. Uh, so I was writing those workouts and, you know, working with those guys and that all takes energy. And I was in the sun. So it was just like, I never was going from that, you know, fight or flight, uh, you know, re sympathetic response at during practice. And then I could never really fully turn off and go to, to rest and recover. Interesting. I'm sorry. Go ahead, call me. <laughs> so, so you, you said you coached an hour a day. I didn't, I didn't know you coached. You're writing workouts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was what, I mean, what's happening is, is in Marin County again, and those wonderful uh, County commissioner uh, zoom chats. One of the allocations was um, summer camps. So with the, that summer camp allocation, um, only one adult could be in charge of 12 athletes at a time. And that adult can't change. So it can't be like the head coach of the local swim team could coach all of the, the groups. Only one coach can coach one group at a time. So when we had, you know, six, seven, eight groups in there, we just needed, we just needed coaches. And Will and I were willing to do it. So it was fun. Uh, it was, it was really fun working with them, change, playing with their technique a little bit. I mean, it's only five hours a week that we got them in the pool, but we were getting, we were squeezing a lot of, uh, we were squeezing a lot out of those five hours. All right. I know. Oh, go ahead. One, go ahead. one last thing. <laughs> oh, you got the finger, Mel. You got the, <laughs> you got the hold up. <laughs> uh, so I know for me personally, um, I learned a lot more when I started coaching than when I was a swimmer. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you, like you said, five hours a day, they're little kids. Um, have, have, have you gained anything from that experience of, of just coaching those kids even in a summer camp format? They're not little kids. So they are like, I think some of them have trials. They're the senior group oh. of, of North Bay Aquatics. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and they are, they're a wonderful, wonderful group. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I felt for them. These, these guys and girls were training in the Bay in March, which is cold for anybody who has ever been in the Bay at any time of the year, but especially in March. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, of course you, you learn a ton. I think, I think the more and more you, I, I was doing it and I have actually, since I had to relinquish that because we, we found a new pool to train at in Walnut Creek. Um, so I, I think it was like understanding how important communication is, um, uh, for coaching and really understanding that the end, like your energy, there's just like a, a, a they're like mirrors, right? It's like your energy gets reflected back at them and then they reflect it back at you. And like things can go in a positive direction, a lot like in economics, like a multiplier effect. It can either go good or it can be bad. And hopefully, you know, you figure out that you can harness it and, and be good, get more energy out of them, uh, get more, you know, effort out of them and ultimately good performances. Okay, can I come in now, Coleman? <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> There's burning questions that I have that are very, very, very important. Like, do you talk to James Magnuson or does he like never talk to you ever again after you beat him by one one hundredth of a second in the 2012 Olympic Games? Uh, I mean, we don't keep in super close touch, but if we, if he was ever in the Bay Area, I wouldn't hesitate to, uh, to say, hey, let's grab a, a socially distanced uh, drink in my backyard or something. Will actually, so my business partner, the guy I own the swim school with, uh, went down there and trained with him for the entire year uh, leading up to 2016. So he's actually pretty close with him. Does Will call him Maggie? Uh, that's a good question. No, he calls him James. <laughs> he calls him James. Okay. I mean, you know, here's the thing. You're the, you're the winner in that scenario. So maybe that's a better question for James. The, uh, we ran into him at uh, Austin City Limits at a, at a festival. We saw him in a distance. Really? And I saw him. He was like, I don't know. He was like a pool length away in a, in a you know, shoulder to shoulder crowd. People are partying. They're going nuts. And I'm like, well, that's James Magnuson. And, everyone, and, and I'm with my wife and with Coleman. They're like, no, it's not. And I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> no way. This was right after Rio. This was in 2016. And we're like, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, we walked up. I have this facial recognition thing. And I was like, yeah, certainly. And it was him. He was super cool. Got a picture no way. of him. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Now he was, he was traveling around the States, having a good time. But, you know, he was going to avoid Great. the Bay Area. And I was like, why? <laughs> oh, that's right. No, he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. He didn't say. He didn't, he didn't say that. That's that's interesting. Uh, so I'll, I'll bring it back, and we'll get a little bit focused. 
you know, it, it's, it's been said over and over and over when you're not around and we're talking behind your back, it's like, <laughs> how many times has Nathan Adrian gone 48 and hundred freestyle? Do you know how many times you've gone 48 and hundred freestyle? You're the most consistent hundred freestyler in his, you don't even know. You don't even know. Venture nah. guess. 80, 80 times? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, the Jimmy, I just don't know. We've got a friend, and he's like I, a mutual friend who we both know and love. And uh, he, he's like, Mel, I think he's done it 70 times. He's, he's, I think he's done it in practice before. Have you done it in practice when you suit it up? Yeah, I've done it a couple times in practice. Um, so when you're that consistent in the 100 free, is it like – do you get behind blocks at certain meets, big meets like nationals? And – you know, and, and you yawn, you're like, uh, no matter what, I'm going to pop out of 48 here. <laughs> Does that happen? Uh, no, no. I think actually it's quite the opposite. Uh, it's like when I step up on the blocks uh, when we're at Olympic Training Center or when we're, you know, Dave just gives us the opportunity to go fast. I'm like, well, this is an opportunity. I'm going to capitalize on it. I know I, I know I can do something, you know, pretty good here uh, and special. So why not do my best to try to do it? Um, and then, you know, that specialness doesn't leave just because you're because you go to a big meet or at nationals or whatever else. Maybe. Coleman and I are very fascinated by this because we have no concept whatsoever of it because we swam 200 butterfly. So <laughs> it's like it's like you might as well be from another planet that it's uh, I think about it. And, 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 you know, it's this, the consistency shows up. You, you you overcame cancer. You came back, went to world championships and you were. And you performed. It was a heroic experience. And the, the, the thought that you was that you turned around and went to Peru. What did you say? Was it before or after? It was after. Peru and, was after. Mm -hmm. And then did it all over again and swam at a high level. Um, how did you do that? How did you turn around, travel to the other side of the world? Because that's going to the southern hemisphere and, and get up and perform again. That was hard. <laughs> that was hard. It was, the last the 10 Pacific minutes, Ocean like? is really, really big. Uh, you cover a lot of time zones. You are on a plane for a long time. Um, it was, it was, uh, it was, I was lucky because um, Lindsay and USOPC allowed me to go uh, maybe a day or two later. Um, I honestly don't know if I, I think I would have maybe been on the verge of a breakdown if I didn't have that time because it was hard. It's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're traveling again, you're going across the Pacific Ocean, then you're going way down to Peru. It's, it's a ways. But, I mean, I was hungry. I was, I was still looking towards, uh, towards trying to swim some individual races. Um, and then I had never been to a Pan Am's before. I, I just wanted to know what it was all about. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. It's a, um, so here's the, you know what, as large as you are, do you fly first class or do they make you fly coach when you travel internationally? <laughs> I have enough miles now that I save them uh, to upgrade. I, basically, I exclusively use my miles to try to upgrade. Um, and then if I don't, I if it's for a meet, I will splurge uh, going to the meet. And then on the way back, I'll just suffer. <laughs> you weren't doing that back in 2008. No. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you, you were just winning. You were just winning your baby gold medals back in 2008. You were just coming on the scene. I just, I just think it's, I, I can't stand flying. And I'm not that big. I'm six one, but being your size and traveling for international meets, it seems like it would be torture to be strapped into a chair. So there was a flight and it was in, I think it was in 2010. We were going to Dubai for the world championships. And this was a different time where USA Swimming felt that it was really important that we all arrive to a world championships on the same flight. So I actually flew the wrong way around the world. So I could arrive in Dubai on the same flight as everyone else. And I remember I, I on the flight from Washington DC to Dubai, I don't think I actually got up more than once or twice. It was bad. It was my worst international meet ever, I think. And I, haven't gone to a short course for championships since. <laughs> I can't imagine you being grumpy, but something tell you're such a nice guy, but I have a feeling that you might have been a little, bit, a little bit grumpy. You throw me in a 12 hour time change uh, and, and only give me a couple days to get over that. You, you'll see me grumpy. That's for sure. So here's the thing, break it down. What, what is your advice to elite athletes who are large, who are on planes? How do you, how do you make it? How do you, how do you make it through the process? I mean, there's just a whole lot of little things that 
can, can help. I mean, first of all, like being hydrated, like well in advance, like not just like, oh, I'm going to drink this bottle on the plane. It's like for the, the entire day before, make sure you're sipping throughout the entire day. If it's, if it's an issue, a big enough issue, I would even, and I have done this, I would consider it, again, I can't give medical advice, so this is just something I do. Uh, I, I've taken ibuprofen uh, for like three, four days leading up to the flight if it's long enough. Um, do your best to sleep well. Like I really do not subscribe to the notion, hey, I'm just going to like not sleep the night before, wake up at 4 a.m. and then sleep so good on the flight. That just like, it's not a recipe for success for me. Um, and then uh, make sure you have enough food and especially protein to, to get you through the flight. Um, you know, for a lot, for a lot of athletes, at least, um, like the ones that are going to be traveling domestically, some of those flights can be really long. I mean, talk about going from New York to LA or something that's like five, six hours, but a total of eight plus hours of travel time, have a couple scoops of, uh, protein in, uh, in Ziploc bags and then have those every two, three hours. Make sure you're ingesting that. Um, cause we all know that they don't feed us enough on the planes. Um, so those those are the things that I do. And then, you know, of course my legs start to feel a little, uh, a little heavy. I'll just get up, stretch a little bit, walk around, um, do whatever. I did the idea of like you sitting next to my, my wife, small, 109 pounds. She gets the same meal that you do. It's just not just. <laughs> well, that's the way, that's the way it goes. That's why I bring, you know, I mean, and it's, it's great. Like USA swimming has done a great job of, of helping us uh, from the USOC level and, and with Alicia Kendig and uh, her nutrition advice. I mean, it's, it's great. She, if she's on the plane with us, she, she has little snack bags for us. If she's not on the plane, but we're all headed to, you know, trials, she'll maybe send out a reminder or, or something like, Hey, this is, you know, important stuff. What, what can you do uh, in, in preparation? So yeah, it's, it's been really helpful. All right. Well, I'm going to say one more thing, Coleman, I'm going to back out. I promise promise i know how much you love nathan adrian and you just want them all to yourself <laughs> the uh, we we actually talked to uh reese whitley we had him on and you know oh, right. and, and it was a timely situation <clears throat> and a lot of interesting things came out of it but something interesting that came out of it was that um you guys talked mm -hmm. and uh and i thought that I've, I've always known that you've been a leader on team usa but when i heard that i was like you know what that makes absolute sense it's um but it was cool to hear. And, uh, but I mean, you know, we're now we're diving into the stats. So we're 1.5% black swimmers in USA swimming in our registration, 327,000, six and a half, just six to six and a half percent mixed. Have you ever felt that, has that ever impacted your career or have you felt different on deck? Yeah. Um, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, I've always, it, it's loaded, no doubt. Uh, and, and I am only starting to figure out my own identity to this day. Um, you know, when, when I was a kid, it was like fill in the blank for the Wassel, Washington standardized. I don't remember what, it, remember what it stood for, but I mean, when I first started taking it, it was only, you know, you can only choose one. And that was kind of the way that it, it was as a kid. It was like, I'm either Asian or I'm white. And I can kind of choose this day or I can choose the other day. And, and there was no real uh, identity for being mixed. Um, and then it was actually Kip Fulbeck, um, a, a guy who is a professor down in uh, UCSB, um, really, really just an awesome guy and a friend. And he reached out to me uh, while I was in college and, and kind of introduced me to the idea that, you know, being Hoppe is an identity in itself. Um, and, and that was actually really helpful. At the time, I, I don't think I fully embraced it or understood it. Uh, but I certainly do now a lot more um, that, that I'm just a little bit older. And, and it's funny. I mean, like, you can just kind of like, identify it. Like I, you can see little kids running around. And if you are Asian, half Asian, or, you know, have a relative who, who is such, you can generally see them and, and point them out um and i i really am, am grateful to him for helping me embrace uh that that identity in in myself coleman you want to follow that i'll say this <laughs> he is a super cool guy he's one of the, the biggest star writers that we have for our magazine and whenever i call on him and say hey 
we've got a unique subject. Would you cover it? He's, he's stepped up and he's done it and he's, he's fantastic. He really is, man. He really is. <clears throat> Uh, I, I kind of want to go back to the hundred freestyle topic. Um, you know, given, I, I know I've talked to you about race strategy and I know you swam a lot of different hundred freestyles in the course of your very long career. Do you ever feel like you have executed a perfect hundred freestyle? <laughs> uh, I mean, 2012 comes close. Um, and, and honestly, like you have to understand that like the hundred freestyle, I think like, in my opinion, uh, <laughs> I think that the, the winner of semis or the first person going into finals should be able to choose their lane. Um, I don't think it's ever going to happen because realistically it only really affects the 100 freestyle. And I think specifically in men, it affects it more than almost any other race. Uh, just because of our size, um, I think we're kicking off a really big wave. Um, like I'm, this isn't trying to be a sexist thing or anything, but I mean, when I, when I throw on bits and paddles, I'm, I'm – I'm 220 plus pounds. Like you're, you're making a big wave. I'm pretty sure I swam next to Natalie a bunch and she was like, I think I could actually maybe surf that. Um, so I don't think it's ever going to change, but bring it back 2012. I mean, that, that race strategy had to, had to be there. Um, knowing that James was going to have an absolutely monster second 50. Um, and it was, it was just, the way that it kind of turned out, I mean, it was crazy though. Like looking back on it, the number of lead changes uh, throughout that race, I think Caesar was out first and then James kind of jumped the gun off the wall. And then I had a little bit of lead and James looked like he was, you know, catching me and, and passing me at about 30 meters. And then I went straight arm and somehow, you know, got my fingers on the ball. It was crazy. Um, but I, I, I know 47, five, that's, that's my best time to this day. And I, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I had a guy next to me going, um, with the same strategy. Um, I, I actually uh, personally believe that there are other meets and other times where I could have gone faster, but just because of the way the field that worked out, I, I didn't. Um, and, and that's, you know, just that's the, how we play the game. I'm not bitter about that. Um, I, should have, I should have changed my strategy a little bit more um, under, understanding what was, what was going to happen. So that's, um, I guess, 2012 to be – to answer is uh, is the one that's been the closest. Coleman said you wouldn't have a perfect freestyle. You said he'll never commit to saying he swam a perfect freestyle. That. You're right. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I do. If you gave me more chances in 2012, I think I could have gone faster. <laughs> Reaction after 2012, um, there was a look of surprise on your face when you reacted, and that was that's what everybody loves in sports. That's the drama of sports. One of my favorite moments in sports was that was that reaction. Uh, when you edged James Magnuson in the 100 meter freestyle, I loved it. <laughs> well, that was a great. I mean, it was that experience was was really something special for in, in so many different ways. Obviously, you know, having my family there that was that was wonderful. Um, one of the things I think that uh, you know, not too many people talk about, but like Matt and I were were roommates there, and the year before. <laughs> Like, if you were to tell us in August of 2011 that, you know, Matt and I were going to be individual champions in the 100 freestyle and 100 backstroke, like, basically, it would have been his parents and my parents that would have bet on that. And that's it. <laughs> you know? Like, I think I got fifth in the 100 free. Matt wasn't even there. He missed out. He didn't even, I don't even think he made pan packs. I don't remember exactly. But I think it was David, Nick Thoman, and Aaron who made pan packs. So Matt was left off that team. But he did um, get high point at nationals in 2011. <laughs> See, fun fact. That's, <laughs> that's excellent. But I mean, and then, and then coming back to the room and after, after I, remember, I remember walking out and I mean, it was just so cool, like looking up at Team USA and, you know, seeing one of my best buddies up there just jumping up and down, cheering as excited as I am. Um, it was just so much fun. It's a lot of, just two big guys. There's a lot of calories consumed. It sounds like a lot of that. Sounds like a lot of math, <laughs> calories consumed. It's, uh, yeah. But it, it, was a, it was two big guys in, uh, in twin extra long beds, that's for sure. Yeah. So in that same vein, uh, what, what would you say the difference is, you know, swimming a flat start on freestyle in an individual event and uh, in anchoring a relay? Not, you know, we know, like, it's more, you know, there's pressure on a relay. You're swimming it for the team, but – 
but kind of a feel or maybe strategy wise, is there a difference there? Totally different. I don't want to go too much into strategy because I think honestly the Americans have it really figured out and uh, a lot of the other countries don't. So I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but there is definitely a, a pretty big strategy shift. Um, and uh, it's helped us. <laughs> yeah. The, have, have you, per, uh, what is a favorite relay swim that you have swum? You know, have you ever had a perfect mm. relay split uh, or no, just George is a favorite? <laughs> uh, uh, favorite, I mean, 2012 again was just like spectacular. I think uh, it was just one of the most fun relays to be a part of. Uh, I had one individually, Matt one individually, Michael one individually, and Brendan had meddled individually. So we were walking in there pretty confident. It's kind of one of those situations where it's like, guys, this is going to be an absolute blast. I'm going to lay it down. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm about to, I'm about to lay the best split I possibly can go, but we're, we should, we're winning this thing. Uh, let's have safe starts. Let's enjoy it. And at the time, I mean, it was Michael's last race. It was also Brendan's last race. Uh, like that's, there's two of my heroes, like growing up, are you kidding me? Like I, I, had dreams of being on, on relays with those guys, but didn't necessarily know it was actually going to happen. Coleman, are you, are you done? Or do you have more follow-ups? <laughs> Go ahead. I just, oh, oh we, yes. I have one down more. To seven Sorry. minutes and I have the most important question to ask you. Okay. Well, this is going to be a short one. Maybe. I don't know. Um, so outside of a 50 or a hundred freestyle, what is the best race you've ever swum? Oh, prelims, Hunter Fly at uh, NCAA's 2011 because I made finals, did my job, and then I think I, don't ask me about finals because I got eighth. So, but I still score those points. That's why you got to go fast in the morning. What did you go? What did you go? Uh, in the morning, I think I went 45 eight. That's legit. So let's talk about your yard swimming because I'm I'm looking at your personal yeah. best eight eighteen six six in the 50 yard free. Is that correct? 41 yeah. and 100 free. Mm-hmm. I got to tell you, but this, this don't convert to the meters times. And I just want to know if you're like, going to drop in on a yards meet somewhere and be <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to put that down. I'm going to lower it. Is it, is it keeping you up at night? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I might pop in. And then when, when, uh, I th- I'm pretty sure Ryan Hoffer tied my record, my cow record. And <sighs> To his credit, he would have blown both of them out of the water this year. Just so you know, he was on track to do great things. And I, I think Pavel would have easily been under 18.6 as well. Uh, but I did do that without a wedge. So all you guys out there thinking that it's apples to apples comparisons, you got to know. All right. <laughs> we'll just, so we'll just, what we'll do is we'll just go and put an asterisk by your, your personal best in your heart. And leave it there. <laughs> With, I mean, yeah. The asterisk with, with, a, with, a, with a, a thousand word paragraph explaining the benefits of the wedge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you write it. You could write it and we'll just, we'll, you know, we'll add it in. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. You can take what you can get. We're down to five minutes. And really just want to check in with you in, in terms of just like, you know, where's your head at? Because, you know, we're, we're rolling into less than a year. And mm-hmm. Got to get back into the pool. We talked to Ryan yep. Murphy. Ryan's like, you know, we're not there yet. We're trying to stay flexible. Mm-hmm. Where's your head yep. at? Uh, I'm re-engaging, and I really like where I'm at, actually. Uh, like I mentioned, I've switched up stuff in the weight room a little bit, going a little higher rep stuff, trying to get trying to get some of that. Let me tell you, man, I, like, right when quarantine hit, I was, like, working at the pool really hard all day, not eating. I lost almost 10 pounds in two weeks. <laughs> It was bad. It was a case of you are dumb. You worked really hard to put all that muscle on. And then in two weeks of just starving yourself, you let it all go. So I'm getting that back now, fortunately. Um, and then as we like kind of progress through, you know, we were, we were swimming up at, uh, at my pool for a little bit. It's four lanes. It does not have gutters. <laughs> it is about three and a half feet deep. It's, uh, it's, it's wavy. It's wavy. And you're talking Ryan Murphy and Reese Whitley. Uh, we don't make small waves. Uh, so we are now at a, at a bigger, deeper pool. We're still swimming yards. The other way uh, is actually, uh, uh, all right. Can you guys see me? Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, the other way is actually 33 and a third, uh, I think yards. So I think that would be really fun just to, Hey, we want to race. We want to do, uh, we want to do relays. We want to do this or that. 
Uh, so I'm going to start lobbying Dave to try to try to let us switch up the, the course of the pool and, and swing some 33 and third. Uh, just to, just to race, compete a little bit, uh, talk a little, talk a little well-meaning trash amongst ourselves and, and have a good time. Cause I mean, that's, that's what keeps us going. Um, right. That, that feeling of, of racing, um, that feeling of improving, uh, that's, that's, that's the sauce, man. That's awesome. Coleman's got, uh, Coleman's got, Coleman's got nothing. I'm jumping in. Yeah, go ahead. You're a public, you're a public health major, right? In, in, in undergrad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, are you watching this whole situation and going, I studied about this. I did case studies about this undergrad and it's all wrong. Did, did, <laughs> did you, I'm just curious, you know, I, that, I knew that was your background, but it's, it's in your, in your education. Is it, uh, you felt like, did you feel informed coming into I do. This? I did. And I do actually, I, I think it's like, it is human nature, a lot of what's happening. I totally understand that. Uh, but as it, actually, on my drive home today, I was like, listen, you'd be hard pressed to find a lot of people who are going to say, hey, stop signs make the world, stop signs are impinging on my freedom. <laughs> you know, like stop signs are there to, uh, to help traffic safety. Masks, I mean, from day one, I was texting my buddies. I was like, this is so stupid. The reason why Taiwan has, Taiwan is there. Taiwan is practically in China. The reason why Taiwan was able to control this so well, one of the major reasons, masks. Um, and and to, like, to everyone's credit, I, I totally understand and appreciate. I mean, I even learned this in school. There is, there's basically an a inverse correlation between public health interventions and personal freedom. Um, I mean, people were super upset about seatbelt laws. I don't want to get pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt. Okay, fine. I think it's stupid. Now we have seatbelt laws. Cell phone laws, same thing. Smoking inside, same thing. Like this is just, it's just, it's repeating, right? It's, it's a helmet laws. I think. Uh, Mel, you asked me this question that got me the most fun up in the last five minutes. I'm just gonna leave it there. Uh, I will say that I think that we can, uh, we can manage this, we can manage it well. Um, what we're seeing right now is is bad and in my opinion it's uh it's it can be fixed if people all act appropriately in response you've been listening to the swim swam podcast stay tuned for new episodes every week you can take swim swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel for more videos as well